Thank you. It, it's, it, it is wonderful to be here, and it has taken us an extra year, so thank you for your patience. Um, just a little spot of the cancer, but it's all better now, so it's good. Um, I would like to, to begin um, talking about something probably pretty personal, and it's already come up a couple of times. So I won't read this. This is the um, abstract that is in your program. So if you get bored with hearing about my problems, feel free to read the abstract. Um, I've had several people ask me if I'm going to do this in French. Let me assure you that that would be very bad. Um, I, I would like to take a moment to let you know just how bad it is because it's a matter of embarrassment for me. I mean, there's the old joke, right? What do you call someone who can speak three languages? Trilingual, two languages, bilingual, one language, American, right? <laughs> and, and I am the absolute worst epitome of this. And it is an embarrassment, but I wanted to let you know that I tried really, really hard. This is my high school, um, and so I took several years of French in grade school. I then decided to do Latin my first year in high school. Um, I failed that. And so I said, well, clearly, first it killed the Romans, then it killed me. I'm going to go back to French. Um, and so I started taking French my sophomore year, and I passed it. I started taking French my, my junior year, and I failed it. Um, I then had to take a summer course uh, on, on it, and I did very well. I got a C, as the, actually as the instructor said, I got a C minus, 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 minus. Um, and then I took it in my, uh, this is how bad I am at, at languages. I would skip school on the days of my French tests. Don't tell my mother. And the reason I would is they would then give me the test and they let me take it in another room. And so I would go to the art room and I would bring my textbook with me and I would take the test with my textbook open. It was not an open book test. And I would still fail it miserably. I mean, this is, this is how bad I was at it. And so the reason I'm not attempting my French is um, I made a promise to my senior year French teacher who is Quebecois. And she came in and said, well, you did, you got this, and you got this, and you got this, and, and frankly, you shouldn't pass this, which means you shouldn't graduate high school. But if you promise never to speak French again, <laughs> I will let you graduate. So that is, that, that is why I'm not even attempting my French here. Now, it's a fun personal story, but it actually leads somewhere, which is, I'm not the only one that has problems in different subjects in, in secondary school and in high school. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting study uh, done by John Falk at the Institute for Learning Innovation at Oregon State University. And what he looks at is he looks at learning and how we can provide learning and how we can push forward learning um, and how oftentimes formal education and formal learning doesn't work very well. And the data he uses to show this is at grade four and eight, in the, not only in the United States, but around the world, they give standardized tests for performance, usually in English, sorry, language, um, in mathematics, and then in science. And what's interesting is, and if you're all right, I would like to wander a bit because this is, they said I could do that. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that at grade four, they take these results, and then they compare them to other countries. So fourth graders in the US scored at number, they were seventh in the world in terms of science language, right? By eighth grade, they dropped to 23rd. The other thing, right? which is the people in the back, if you got stuff with the grade. Right? <laughs> now, and then what's interesting that a lot of people don't know is they actually continue this test through different stages of life. And so when they study people after college in the work life, the United States jumps to number one of understanding the science. Now, what he points out in this study is, isn't it interesting that the difference between grade four and that last as adult is actually the amount of formal education in science increases. So what happens is grade eight is not only showing that they are slipping in science, but that formalized education in science has actually pushed performance down. And you say, well, that's interesting, Dave. What do I care about? But 
This idea that when we try and establish places where people learn and understand, that if we approach education, if we approach learning in a transactional way, that is, that people need to go through formal curriculum, formal understanding, that we actually may be causing more harm than good. So the question also then becomes, he talks about this U-shaped performance, right? And so the question becomes for us, because I know many of us are academic librarians who are working in universities. I'm not sure, I hope that we have some school librarians where you're working on a regular basis, public librarians, people in archives, people in specialties. This is actually some very interesting news that we need to pay attention to. Because as part of the study, they then ask, well, where do they make it up? Where does this magical knowledge occur? Are they taking science classes like on the weekends? And the answer is no. What they're doing is they're getting it from all sorts of different places. One of the places is from work. You're not going to see that here. But on a regular places, people who do engineering, people at work having to learn different science skills, etc. So it's not all just YouTube on the weekends. But it's also looking at the use of informal science venues, where people are learning about science includes public libraries, zoos and aquariums. Natural History Museum, Science Museums, and you can see here how they break down in the different states and countries. And as always, being an American, I have totally ignored my host today. I apologize. But these, this data does go across North America as well. So this is interesting. This is good news. But it tells us something that we need to be considered of, right? It tells us that when we talk about learning, and I want to be really clear, which is why in an information and documentation system I'm talking about learning, because that's what we're here for, right? The goal isn't just, hey, we've got a bunch of documents and we send them out. Hopefully, we're making a positive difference in the world with them. Hopefully, we're helping the undergraduates in our classes perform better. We're helping our students in K-12 and learn more. We're helping our scientists. We're helping our writers. We're helping our artists get better. We're in the learning business. And so we need to know something about learning. The first thing we need to know about learning is that learning doesn't happen as a transaction. You don't buy learning. You don't have little modules of knowledge. So this is just for fun. We used to talk, think about learning. I used to, I mean, like in the 1800s, 1900s, and we built industrial learning systems, right? We built the factory floor that we call our public education. We used to think of people as buckets, right? I'm not sure. How do we say buckets in French? <laughs> One book. And so, <laughs> you are all, congratulations, buckets. <laughs> and you're empty, and the good news is that I am here with bricks of knowledge, and I'm going to fling them out at you with my wonderful words, and I'm going to fill your bucket full of learning. Now, let's be honest. Some of your buckets are a little wider than others. So some are going to bounce. Some are going to make it in somehow. But that was the idea, right? This is the old sage on the stage, the professor getting together and lecturing for 12 hours like anyone cares. We know that's not how it works. I can't educate you. I can't teach you. I can only create a place where you can learn. I can create conditions. I can keep your attention. I can provide an area that's not crowded. I do all of this stuff, but ultimately, you are responsible for learning. And so when it comes to French, that poor teacher, who, God bless her, she was Quebecois, so it's easy, you know. Um, <laughs> the, proud, the proud tradition of mercy of the Quebecois <laughs> came to St. Xavier High School. Um, it wasn't her fault that my bucket was a little narrow, but it wasn't her fault that I wasn't paying attention that I was doing lots of other things and other things that I cared about. I was not immersed in the environment. Cincinnati, Ohio, not exactly the francophone capital of the world. Right? <laughs> At the best, it's German. And even then, all we got were really good hot dogs. And so um, we know that it's now a different way of thinking about how people learn. And so back to this idea that I'm going to come to again and again, which is when we look at our roles, and we look at the idea of inviting people in and users and bringing communities in, if we bring them into a space but we still treat them as buckets, right? It, it's like when someone walks up, how many, do I have folks who, who are sort of reference librarians or consider them reference librarians? All right. 
Are you the kind of reference librarian that takes their job very seriously? <laughs> Are you the kind of reference librarian that chases people out the door until you're done? <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing a study on what? Well, that's fascinating. Let's do some searches. Great, that's the paper I need. No, 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 let's do some more searches. <laughs> no, 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 that's the paper I need. No, 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 just a couple more. <laughs> Driving home late at night, making sure they're not following you. <laughs> right? They're buckets. We'll just keep putting more stuff in. Well, what we know about learning is that learning is actually done as a conversation. Now, that can be a conversation between you and I, but most of those conversations are with ourselves. Right? So if you're sitting there going, what does he mean by that? You've just demonstrated my point, which is you talk to yourself about what did he mean by that. And we do this all the time. This is called metacognition. This is called critical thinking. There's lots of different words we put it, but in essence, we talk amongst ourselves. And so even, we do talk among people, we talk among groups. Right now, there's a conversation occurring, but it's actually not between you and I, because you're being very nice. I mean, there's some visuals, I can see if people are falling asleep, I can hear the laughter, but hopefully what a good lecture does, the conversation still, isn't here, it's within yourself. You're sitting there going, oh, that's interesting, that's not interesting, I knew that, whatever it is. And hopefully that continues on to time. So you have conversants, and what those conversants are doing is they're exchanging language. And for your sake, English in this case, right? And so language is going back and forth, and why are we doing it? We're seeking an agreement. Okay, I agree, two plus two equals four. All right, I agree. I understand that. That will help me to the next stage, to the next stage, to the next stage. And one of the most important agreements is agreeing not to agree, which is this is not going to work for me. Let us move on. And we have a memory, and a very, very, by the way, imperfect memory of when things, what agreements we have. As an example, you probably cannot remember where you learned two plus two equals four. You probably cannot remember when you learned a certain text. The example of this often is your favorite book. Right? You go back to your favorite book every five years, 10 years, whatever it is. And as you're reading that book, you're like, oh, that section that like changed my life, that was the best part of this book, turned out it was a page. <laughs> you're not the entire book was about this subject, but it turns out it was like a paragraph thrown away in the corner. Our memory will change in, in this. Now, sometimes you do remember. You may remember something because that person, that teacher, that conversation, that moment had such meaning that I connected to it. For example, just to continue to talk about how bad I am at your language, um, I know the exact moment when the train left the rails in me learning French. It was when the teacher introduced pronouns. <laughs> Le pet. Right? Which in English is. Hmm? Le pet? Oh, that which one is this? Really? <laughs> but that was the moment. I mean, I literally said to myself, it was like that moment I just stopped and said, well, I'm done. <laughs> it's like, I just stopped in here. Yeah, we got a song, you know. I, Je suis, well, je m'appelle David, right there. By the way, that's it. That's all I do. Right? But when it was suddenly Le Pell, I'm like, I have no clue what you just said, and I'm done. Right? Yeah. And, and so our memory changes. It oftentimes gets rid of things when we learn and how we learn and such. We just retain that agreement, that understanding. That's why, for example, documentation becomes so important. Our books, our materials, is it gives us a chance to sort of anchor our understanding. It is not our knowledge. Knowledge is not put into a book. There's no such thing as a knowledgeable object. This is where knowledge resides. But those objects, those materials, those books, it's a way of us sort of doing milestones, materials to start the conversation, important ways of understanding them. So if we're about learning and we're about conversations, conversations are participatory. You can't have a one-person conversation or else they send you to places with medication. Right? <laughs> that idea that you have to give and take. 
I mean, how many times have you been in a classroom environment where you're just like, all they do is sit and talk. I mean, I can't, I don't have a chance to say anything. I'm not gonna pay attention. That important participation, right? And so participation is about co-ownership. If we want people to learn, we must help them engage in conversations with themselves, with others, with experts, what have you. And that means we must allow them to participate in their learning, and that means we have to help them co-own that enterprise. Now, this creates a pressure. The pressure is when you're in a learning environment, whether you're a formal student, whether you're a workshop, whether you're just going in life, is you want participation, you want that co-ownership. And so we see that in places such as Facebook. It's interesting that these days we look at Facebook, of course, as inherently evil, and it is. Um, it started in 2004, right? Now, I know I'm getting old, and so I know there are probably now people that like are alive in 2004, that 15 are in high school. My son was born one year ahead of time, right? So there's people who've known pretty much their entire life has been Facebook, but for us, that's not that long ago. This is their growth, and they've gone up to 2 billion users, registered users. Now, 90% of those are Russian chatbots, but <laughs> the other 10 of us are people that are getting our information mined for evil means of money. But between that, this is an amazing growth. I mean, that's 2B with the billion. That sector, social media, that is, didn't exist. 15 years ago, and now it's huge. That didn't happen just because of sort of addictive techniques and endorphins. It happened because it was a place that we could participate, we could share, we could choose who we hear from and who we did. We created an environment, we used an environment that allowed us to participate in a conversation. And what's interesting is even given this data, this is the latest data that shows that even not enough participation. So what's happened is this orange line represents the um, messaging apps that have now surpassed use in social media. People are skipping the, the uh, walls, they're skipping their timelines, and they're going directly to talking back and forth, WhatsApp and messaging. People want to control, to own, to converse. They want, if they're going to be learning, once again, learning about pop culture, learning about how to cook in the Instant Pot, learning about the politics of, they want a participation, they want a voice. Now, what we also have to understand is this has affected libraries in a very concrete way, which is at the same time we've seen this dramatic rise in social media, dramatic rise in messaging apps, we have also seen a rise in the usage of libraries and library organizations, right? That whole thing about we have Google, we don't need libraries, right? That whole world has changed and we're seeing that people are coming to libraries. But the, once again, they're bringing with them this attitude of participation, of learning, of co-ownership. They're coming, when you look at public libraries and we ask, why are you coming? Yes, materials, but why we go from four visits per capita on average to five visits is they're coming as a place as a third place, as a place to learn, community, programming, sharing, etc. We're seeing this move to more community hubs because it's part of this push for more participation, for more ownership. Now, we could stop there and say that's lovely. But I, I ran across, and this is, you know, I'm going to admit it, I ran across a lovely tweet the other week. And I didn't copy it down, but it was something along this line, which is remember when we thought, er, which, <laughs> when we thought the internet would bring us together? <laughs> remember when the internet was going to be the great equalizing factor? Mm -hmm. If we pull enough fiber and enough wire and enough satellite to the most remote places, inner city youth, rural youth, city youth, we would all begin to discuss and learn and we'd become happy moments. That was, that was the goal. I, mean, I remember in the 1990s working on that PhD, that was it. If I get schools connected and children in 
Syracuse, New York, and talk to the children in Montreal, and can talk to people in Lyon, and can talk to people, then a great understanding is going to grow. I think about this a lot, because that idealism, that quest, drove me. I mean, that, it pushed me, and I know many of the people we were involved with, in creating subsidy programs, creating internet connections, creating learning and training materials, putting out public access terminals, right? And for my academic library colleagues, dragging professors online. So University of South Carolina, their internet went out two Fridays ago. I literally, literally it gone. And I sent my staff home. I said, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and it struck me as I was running to go home. Well, this was a Friday. I mean, if the internet's going to go out, it was a beautiful sunny Friday. <laughs> That's just God saying, take some time. <laughs> As I was driving home, I was like, remember when I had colleagues that go, why do I need a computer at my desk? And once again, everyone here who's under the age of 30 is looking at me going, there was a den that just didn't have a computer. You know, I, I'm not bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it wasn't that long. In fact, I'm guessing there are still people on a regular basis that you're working with in the academy that may have that computer on the desk. Gathering stuff as a paperweight, right? But we've been pushing people to open access, buying open materials, teaching online. Teaching. We've been pushing because this is what we believe. And yet, and yet, when we look, and we see these great technolo technological marvels. People are using them to one happy, lovely. But they're using it to spread misinformation. They're using it to create bubbles that they can only talk to other people. Now, here's the bad news. For the people in this room, that's our fault. As we pushed for this, as we ideally thought that simply providing access was sufficient for a global communication and understanding, as we created filters and search engines so people could narrow their searches and wouldn't be dealt a pan of information <coughs> overload, we built the algorithms that created micro communities. We built the systems that created an ability for people to substitute research with belief. We are responsible for helping to sustain, promote, and build an infrastructure that has allowed for a massive misinformation campaign to go. I know it's not all our fault. But a lot of it is. And what we're trying to do now is almost make up for it. It's okay, it's okay. We'll offer a Facebook class. It's okay, it's okay. We'll offer a Twitter class. We'll offer a class. But it's still based on the same presumption that if I give them access, in this case, to my training, that is sufficient for action. And it's not. How many of you are on an internet list serve for librarians? How many of you, keep those hands up, hands up. Please keep your hands up if you would like to remain on the list serve with a bunch of librarians. <laughs> Masochist, masochist. <laughs> it's the Twitter dumpster fire of the day. Yes. Isn't it amazing that we want to create a more understanding, connected social community, and yet oftentimes in our own transactions and our own internet transactions, we don't even pay attention to it. How many times are we at the point that when the premier talks about whether we need the internet or not. What actions do we take? Now there are some, and we do it, and it's great. But how do we deal on a daily basis with people who want to shelter themselves online as opposed to connect online? How much action are we doing? So access is not the question. To improve our societies, to promote, produce, promote that. <laughs> to improve our societies, yeah, even English is tough. <laughs> <laughs> To improve our society is not enough to say, we have the stuff, we have the information, we have the documents. We have to take responsibility, and we have to understand that if people are gonna truly learn, they also have to have agency, they have to have authority, they have to have ownership. And so, neighbors, not users. 
I hate users. I hate that word so much. Computer users or computer scientists and drug dealers have users. The rest of us <laughs> can have something else. Because here's the question: How many of us want to be used? <laughs> Don't even get start getting started on consumers. But that idea that oh they'll come in and they'll use this transactional idea. They come in, they ask the question, we give them a dot. They come in, they're looking for material, we find it, we send them out. We create this disconnect as if we're a big service desk, and we're proud of it, and we should be because we want to serve, but we serve at a distance. It's like the phrase, the phrase, how can I help you? This phrase in whatever language, we see it as central to our identity as libraries, as information professionals. We see this as the ultimate statement of our desire to be of service. How can I help? But put that into context and realize that it can also be the most arrogant statement you can make. How can I help you? <laughs> How can I, someone with an advanced degree in studies, someone who works in this enormous building, filled with all of these documents that are intimidating the hell out of you, how can I <laughs> help you? <laughs> but clearly you have failed because you have to ask someone else for help. <laughs> Think about that a moment. If you, how happy are you to stand up and say, I don't know? Right? Because that's the other trick, which is once they give you the question, we run into what I call the greedy librarian problem. The greedy librarian problem will not give up a question until they are dead or the person they asked to die. We're back to chasing them home. It's my problem. I will solve it because that's my job. I will be of service. When the best solution might be, I don't know. Instead of asking people, how can I help you? What if we ask them, what are you learning today? What are you doing that I can be a part of? How can you bring me into your quest for research, for a question, for resources? How can I be part of your world? Not how can I help you? So these are neighbors. These are members. This is in the US. People, uh, many studies went in, they said, what should we call them? <laughs> them. Who's them? Them is not us, right? Them is not librarians. How do we call them? We call them users, or we call them customers, uh, or we call them patrons. When in fact, when you ask them, they say, I'm a member, I have a card. I'm part of a community member. Whether that community is a place I live, whether that community is a place I work or I study, that's a community. Now, I put an asterisk next to user. This is the Doc One Library in Opera's um, center. The current, I think, one of the best examples of, 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 a, of a public library, that a library of any type, truly <coughs> representing community ownership. It's an amazing place. They use the word users. And I was having a conversation slash argument. <laughs> and what they said is actually where that, the word where that comes from, where we chose that, was from architects. The architects, when they were designing this building, they said, they kept saying, how do you use this space? How do you use that space? Which, you know, that makes sense. I use this space. I use this. And what they realized is, well, they're users. Now, what's interesting is when they use the word users, they don't just mean the community. They also mean librarians. The library has used the library has users. Some of them come from the community. Some of them work as librarians. Some of them are clerical staff. Some of them are politicians. They're all users of this facility because this facility is not the library. It is a tool of the library. The library for them is a movement. It's a movement meaning the library is meant to help a community move forward. It's meant to create action. This place, wonderful, beautiful, one tool that we can use to do what we want to do, which is community improvement, community empowerment. So I'll allow it. I'm going to give you a few examples because access is insufficient. 
So in what we're talking about, I know we're going a little late. I'm getting close. I want to give you from sort of simple to very complicated ways of how, to, how it looks to truly invite a community into the library, not to use it, not to occupy it, not to take a transaction, but to truly be part of the library. What does that look like? Here's a really, really simple example. This is the uh, Ann Arbor District Library in Michigan, for my history credit. <laughs> and this is their catalog. And their catalog, it looks remarkably like a catalog. <laughs> but what's interesting, if you scroll down, after you see all its availability, you'll see this screen. And this screen is built into the catalog. They have reviews and summaries, but these are all community users, community comments. And I know, once again, going back to what we've done with the internet, never read the comments, but <laughs> They are curated, right? There is an there's a accessible use policy established with the community. And so the idea is, it's not just what the you know, book list review says about it, it's what our community says about it, how they use it, how they understand it. Right? How do we look at this catalog, not as here's an inventory of our stuff for you, but here's an area of how does the community look at this corpus and how they understand it, interpret it, understand it. What's great about it is when they mine these comments and they look at what people are saying, they end up with things like this. This is, you'll notice, it starts with a book and then goes to the fact that you can check out a synthesizer and amplifier. You can check out a loom if you would like to do weaving. You can check out all sorts of musical instruments. In some libraries, you can check out fishing poles and you can check out people and all this other stuff. This is a comes from the community, not just librarians going, I think we should have musical instruments in our collection. It comes from the community going, we could use this to your understanding. Simple examples. More complicated examples, because I know that I have lots of folks that are in academic libraries. This is Kaki's Reading Express. That red bird is Kaki. Um, I, uh, the University of South Carolina, in case you're wondering, and I know you're not, are the game cocks. That's correct. The mascot of my, my school is based on animal fighting. It's true. Um, long story. Hockey's the mascot. Now, the other thing that you have to understand is when you live in Montreal, and when you live in Syracuse, New York, as I used to, you do not understand what college football means. <laughs> the first college football game I went to in South Carolina began with, began with three military jets flying over the table, <laughs> followed by, I'm not making this up, pillars of flame shooting up as the football team ran onto the field. This, and I realized that this is not football, this is football. And so there are three-year-olds that you will say, where are you going to college? And they will say, I am going to South Carolina because I believe in this football. It is hot. It is really hot. Anyway, that's hot. Now what Hot to Green Express does is they have a bus. And they get a on a bus with a bunch of undergraduates from all over the university. They drive to the poorest schools in the state. They get out and they do story time and they do reading and all the kids have to take Hockey's promise where they raise their hand and promise to read a book a day. What, they, what we have done is we have linked a cult of football to the cult of literacy. Because let's say this, we also have our trauma. <laughs> that reference step is either going to be a place where people ask questions or where we will do an animal sacrifice after an hour. <laughs> this is amazing. And so the best thing about this is this leads into, so as an academic library, this leads into something called the student read-in. 2,500, well, 2,000 students from all around the state congregate at the state house. That's them sitting on the steps of the state house where Cocky and other people like Clemson show up. And then they do story time and they read and they read loudly so that hopefully the legislators inside hear 2,000 children calling for the need for literacy calling for support. We began creating something called South Carolina Thrive where anyone can walk in, student, anyone from the community can walk into our library and say, 
I need help in food aid, and if I need housing and social services, and we provide mentoring and mentorship support. We can help the homeless find housing. And while you may ask, why is an academic library, why is an academic unit providing this kind of service? Because there are homeless students everywhere at universities. This is from the CDC. 70,000 post-secondary students in Canada experience homelessness. Is your academic library doing something about that? Is your academic library providing a warm space? But is it also then providing services and connections? That idea that our communities are not just the people who walk in the door, they're in the whole university, they're in the whole community, they're in the whole school, they're in the whole province, they're in the whole country, they're in the whole world. What are we doing to solve it? Because the idea of ownership comes with an obligation. I'll go through really quickly the last one. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> Which is what's the next step? This is the public, this is the strategic plan of the Topeka, Kansas Public Library. And you'll notice that their goals are support the economic vitality of our community, <laughs> monitor and respond to societal change with information to help people manage and improve their lives. Support and nourish the community spirit, imagination, and culture. Contribute to the growth and development of our community, families, and children. This is the strategic plan of the library. And their goals are all about the community. And it's not just wonderful words. Going with this, they listed. This is what the goal was. This is the project we're doing. This is the action we've taken. This is who's responsible. Here's our latest update. They've tied community improvement directly to their strategic plan, directly to their performance reviews and analysis of their librarians, and directly to what they do on a daily basis. When you look at your strategic plan, how much of it is, we're gonna be a great place for, to work for, we're gonna build a brand of libraries, we're gonna get more people in the door. And how many are? We're going to make sure the people who walk through the door and who don't walk through the door have a better life because we're here. This is the Richland County Public Library. One of their major parts of strategic plan, <coughs> advance our community. What does that mean? Goal one, help create a strong and resilient economy. Goal two, strengthen community cohesion. Goal three, transform educational outcomes. Goal four, increase equity inclusion and opportunity in the community not just in the library not just in a service or two but in the whole community and what's amazing about this is they didn't develop this on their own they sat for two years working with community elders working with law enforcement working with mayors working with citizens working with politicians to develop the library strategic plan because indeed it's now the community's strategic plan what does our planning look like? How are we responsible? If I'm out there and I'm an academic librarian and I go to serve someone at a homeless shelter, is that gonna get me credit towards tenure or promotion or my annual evaluation? How do we put reality to that? So I will close with this. So when I die, this will probably be etched somewhere. <laughs> Beware what you tweet, because um, it was like a flippant tweet, and, you know, that bad libraries build collections, good libraries build services, great libraries build communities. I'm, I'm actually hesitant to bring this up because now there will be tweets. <laughs> Why are collections bad? That's not what I said. <laughs> are you saying there's such a thing as bad libraries? Yes, I'm saying there's such a thing as bad libraries. <laughs> I, by the way, I love getting these when they have absolutely no people in them. It's like, you realize that's exactly what this doesn't say. You put this in front of you. Use it. If it's useful, use it. It's great. I love it. It's happy. But understand that what that statement is, is not a piece of propaganda. It is not simply a throwaway line. It is not, yes, communities are important. It's a call to action. It says that you are responsible for your community. It says that as a librarian, when you got into this job, whether you got into it for the materials, whether you got in it for the, for the hours, whether you got it in because you love to read or grade a crossword puzzle, I don't care. Now that you're here, 
Now that you're an information professional, you're an archivist, you're a librarian, you're an academic librarian, now that you're here, you have a job. You have a role, you have a responsibility. At the end of the day, how well your stacks are organized, how well your licensees are put in place, however you want to define it, your ultimate success is, how have you made a person's life better today? How have you taken someone who did not have a voice and give them a voice? How have you said that I'm inviting my people into my library, not as a space, not as a service to them, not as a gift, but because I need to leave that building, I need to leave it digitally, I need to leave it in person, I certainly need to leave it conceptually and say, that collection is my community. That's what I need to work on. Those books, those databases, those buildings, they're beautiful, they're important, but they're tools. Ultimately, what we seek to do is to make the world a better place. And we're not going to do that by hiding in the sacks, and we're not going to do that by pretending that we're objective and that we're neutral. We are not. We're on a mission to make the world a better place. That takes views, that takes political participation, that takes a lot of dialogue, that takes connecting with people who disagree with us, that takes getting out of the building on a regular basis. It takes the understanding that a library is people, you and the community together, forging a better tomorrow. Thank you very much. de répondre aux questions, mais euh, je, vous ai, je vous rappelle que M. Lancaster va signer son livre euh, dans le foyer, donc si vous voulez l'aborder, vous lui poser des questions, euh, personnellement, je pense que ça lui fera plaisir d'y répondre. Et M. Lancaster sera aussi euh, demain soir euh, au cocktail euh, de fin de journée pour euh, le lancement de l'édition augmentée de son livre. Pour euh, conclure cette session, j'inviterai Jean-Michel euh, la pointe qui a coordonné un peu le, la traduction de son ouvrage à dire quelques mots de remerciement.